I am Bruno Vermeer, so it's my pleasure to chair this uh, session uh, of this uh, conference. And uh, we will start uh, right away with Marin Bukov from uh, uh, Max Planck in, uh, in Dresden. And it's the uh, first 45-minute uh, talk, and then we'll have two 30-minute uh, talk. And this talk is about uh, disentangling multi-qubit states using deep reinforcement learning. Thanks a lot uh, for the nice intro, Benoit, and also thanks to the organizers for uh, having me here. Um, so this is a story that's been ongoing for quite some time, and I think some of you may or may not have seen like a previous version of this, um, but uh, recently the story started growing, and uh, you know, it's basically very close to completion. This is kind of a nice sign of it. <clears throat> so as the title suggests, uh, I'm going to be telling you about disentangling multi-qubit states using deep reinforcement learning. Um, and here is essentially uh, the menu for today. We'll first go briefly over a short introduction motivation. I basically want to introduce what the disentangling problem is um, and how you, sh uh, you can think about it. Uh, then we'll briefly talk about reinforcement learning and how to set up the reinforcement learning framework um, for the disentangling problem. And this is where you'll probably see some of the concepts that uh, um, you guys have seen also last week uh, from Florian Marquardt. Um, and then we'll discuss the results. So we'll talk about disentangling few cu qubit states, so two, three, and four qubit states, and then multi-qubit uh, random states, uh, in particular five and six qubits. And then, time permitting, we'll talk about uh, some of the applications of this business, um, in particular for reducing uh, C naught counts, um, how resilient these approaches to various sources of noise, um, and also, hopefully, I can show you like a little application to um, modern NISC devices. So let's get started um, with the intro and motivation. So as you probably know, one of the defining characteristics of quantum states is quantum entanglement. Um, if I have a Bell state and I measure the state of, uh, say, the first particle, then this will automatically collapse the state of the second particle. Um, and this is something that was first realized in 1935 by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, uh, and was called famously a spooky action at a distance. But if you forward uh, roughly 100 years to 2024, uh, we're now thinking about how to make use of quantum entanglement in order to develop new quantum uh, technologies. And to do that, uh, one useful uh, quantity is the entanglement entropy because it allows us to quantify the amount of entanglement um, in a quantum state. So it's given um, here by this expression. So it's the Shannon entropy of the reduced density matrix row one, um, which can be computed from the density matrix of the state by tracing out, say, um, the second qubit. And then if I find that the entanglement entropy is greater than zero, then I know that uh, my state um, has uh, entanglement in it. Um, so besides quantum technologies, of course, quantum entanglement has applications in other fields of physics, and uh, that's also why we care about it. Um, like, uh, um, in particular, in quantum optics, um, um, you know, experimentalists and theorists use beam splitters in order to entangle photons, uh, and they study um, uh, states of entangled photons. Uh, but also in condensed matter physics or many body physics, entanglement can play a crucial role. Um, uh, in particular, um, defining ground states of uh, spin liquids, for instance. So over the last 10 years, uh, we've already achieved a number of milestones trying to understand and manipulate quantum entanglement. And let me just mention here a few um, uh, points. Um, so the first one is that we are able to implement perfect two-qubit entanglers. Um, what this basically means is that uh, on the level of small systems like uh, um, two qubits, um, we can uh, manipulate entanglement with a very high uh, precision. Um, but over the last maybe three or four years, we've also managed to uh, do this or to scale this up um, um, to the many-body regime, and in particular, uh, two interesting um, applications or realizations are the ground state of the toric code um, or, um, you know, um, you know many-qubit GHZ states. And these, um, you know, there have been experiments, as I'm showing you here, um, that were able to, uh, to prepare these states. So this is kind of on the fundamental side. You know, these are interesting states, and we care about them because they uh, show us how to think about fundamentally different uh, um, um, types of order. Uh, but entanglement and controlling the dynamics of entanglement also has practical applications. And I just want to mention here uh, two applications. So the first one, it turns out that if you want to prepare a state on a quantum computer, on a quantum device, uh, an arbitrary state, then the way to go is to first figure out how to disentangle that state, and then you reverse that process in order to get um, to your, uh, uh, you know, to prepare your target state. And what this tells us is that you can view entanglement as a proxy for the complexity of a quantum state. So in some sense, you can uh, classify states according to how much entanglement um, they have. 
Um, and the second application is kind of a generalization of this state preparation procedure, which is when you have an arbitrary unitary operation and you want to decompose this unitary operation on a quantum device into native gates, uh, then um, 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 modern algorithms um, also do a sort of a disentangling procedure um, in order um, um, to do what is known as transpilation or, or circuit decomposition. So these are just you know, a few practical and a few fundamental applications of, uh, of entanglement and controlling entanglement. And as I al already advertised in this talk, I want to talk about disentangling quantum states. And so let me define for you the uh, quantum disentangling problem. So suppose that we have a pure state psi of L qubits, which I'm showing here in this picture. Um, now, if I consider subsystem A to be the subsystem of a single one of these qubits, then I can, I have already shown you, I can compute the reduced density matrix by tracing out over all the remaining qubits. Um, and then I'm left with a, uh, a single qubit reduced density matrix from which I can compute the entanglement entropy. Now, to check if the state psi is entangled, one thing I can do is I can look at the average single qubit entanglement entropy, which is shown here in this equation. So if I find that the average single uh, qubit entanglement entropy is zero, then it means that psi is in a product state. Why? Because uh, the entanglement entropy is a non-negative number, so if I find that this sum here is, uh, is zero, then it means that its constituents have to be zero separately, but if the all the constituents are zero, then it means that every qubit is basically disentangled with all the others, and so therefore uh, we have a product state. And the other way around, if you have a product state, then it immediately uh, follows that uh, the average uh, single qubit entanglement is zero. So that's a quantity that uh, I, I'm gonna be focusing on uh, throughout that talk. And now, the disentangling procedure goes as follows. So the goal here is to find a unitary operation U such that when you apply it to your favorite state psi, we basically get um, you know, the product state everything down or everything zero. However, you know, there's always some unitary operation in a huge Hilbert space because unitary operations have some sort of generalized rotations, but there is a catch. What we want to um, impose on, on this unitary is that it can be constructed out of local uh, or two qubit operations. And the reason why we want to do this is because this is what's accessible uh, on, on uh, modern devices. So interactions in, nat in nature are local, and therefore um, uh, we have access only to uh, um, local um, unitaries. However, I would allow myself to consider non-adjacent um, 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 qubits. So basically, I'm not gonna be only talking about unitaries that are applied on neighboring qubits, but also unitaries that are applied on qubits that are far away, but only on a pair of qubits at a time. And this is something that is not so um, restrictive because um, modern uh, uh, platforms such as trapped ions or Rydberg um, atoms uh, can actually realize such, uh, such distant uh, two qubit um, unitaries. Okay. So that's essentially um, um, the setup. And now the goal for us is to find a disentangling circuit which consists of two qubit gates um, in such a way that in the end we get like this product state. And this is just an example of such circuit. Um, you know, this uh, gray object here is the state, then I'm labeling the qubits one through eight. Um, and then you can kind of see these are two qubit gates and they can be uh, neighboring, uh, they can be acting on neighboring qubits or also um, on uh, distant qubits. Now, if you think about it, the disentangling problem is essentially a two-fold optimization problem. So first, what you need to do is you need to find the optimal order of the pairs of qubits to apply the two qubit unitaries on. And second, once you've identified an optimal pair, you also need to find the optimal angles that parameterize the corresponding unitary to act on it. So once again, the discrete part comes from choosing the pairs, and then the continuous part comes from parameterizing the unitary that should act on these pairs. And as it often happens, you know, whenever you have a mixture of a continuous and a discrete optimization problem, then the problem is way too difficult. And part of the difficulty uh, can be understood as follows. So first, if you think about the continuous optimization, then this is a difficult problem because the Hilbert space of, you know, of my system of L qubits grows exponentially with the number of qubits. Um, but even if you didn't have, you know, like to worry about the continuous optimization, then the discrete problem itself is also quite challenging because if you have L qubits and you fix the number of gates or unitaries that you can apply to your state, uh, then you have again an exponential number of different ways you can arrange these unitaries. And so there's another kind of exponential that lurks there. And so we have like two, uh, um, you know, two uh, uh, types of optimization problems, a dis discrete and a continuous one, and what we want to do is we want to consider them separately. So, uh, very quickly, I just want to mention that the continuous optimization problem can be solved exactly 
the way it's done uh, basically is the following. So we are uh, applying two qubit, uh, um, uh, sorry, we are applying two qubit gates, um, and so the relevant object is the two qubit reduced density matrix, and so it turns out, and that's something that I can explain later on, to find an optimal local unitary, all you need to do is, you, uh, is uh, diagonalize this two qubit reduced density matrix. So this um, um, diagonalization gate is actually a two qubit gate, uh, that, um, and uh, we can use that um, um, in order to uh, disentangle locally to solve the continuous optimization problem. And one thing or two things that I wanted to remember is that this uh, local, um, um, locally optimal gate will depend explicitly on the state, right? So if I change the state, then I will change the, uh, the gate. Um, so uh, it's not universal. Uh, and second, uh, it's not unique. So there are multiple ways you can do that. So once again, you know, this is a complicated slide, but all I wanted to take home from this is that there is a way how to compute the locally optimal two qubit unitary, um, and uh, we will assume that we have access to that. And so this leaves us with a discrete optimization problem. And the discrete optimization problem, once again, is the problem of choosing the correct order and pairs of qubits in which to place this locally optimal unitary on. Um, <clears throat> and so once again, for each pair, we are going to apply um, um, such a gate. However, this is not enough. We want to incorporate experimental constraints, um, uh, which uh, go as follows. So first, we want to be uh, applying as few gates as possible. And the reason for this is that these gates are actually extremely noisy um, on modern devices. On, and so we want to um, you know, uh, decrease the number of gates that we apply. Um, and second, um, I want to be you know, a little bit greedy. So I want to really be able to disentangle an arbitrary initial state. So you give me your favorite state of you know, L qubits, uh, and then I want to be able to construct like um, the sequence of unitaries to do that. And in particular, you know, we are interested in states that uh, have no uh, immediate, immediately obvious entanglement distribution or entanglement structure, such as, for instance, high random states. So for those who don't know, high random states are states uh, whose amplitudes are drawn randomly from normal distribution. And so, as I mentioned, this is, you know, this discrete optimization problem is a difficult combinatorial problem, and what this talk is going to be about is I'm going to tell you how to use reinforcement learning in order to solve that problem. Yes? Uh, yes, it is, and we'll come to this in a second. Okay, now, um, why is a disentangling problem difficult, right? So let me just, uh, you know, show you now two different ways how you could approach this problem, um, and then this is going to reveal why the problem is complicated. So once again, we can see the high random states, and now I want to define what I call a random agent, which goes as follows. So the random agent will select um, the pairs of qubits, i and j, uniformly at random. So it selects, you know, randomly two qubits, it applies the locally optimal disentangling gate, and then what I want to do is I want to monitor this average entanglement entropy as shown here. So this is kind of the figure of merit and see how, it's, uh, how it goes down uh, as the number of gates uh, M increases. And what I'm showing you here on that figure is on the X axis the number of gates and on the Y axis this average entanglement entropy and the different colors correspond to different system sizes. And what you see here are two ob observations. So first, the average entanglement goes down exponentially with the number of gates and you think, that's good, right? It goes down fairly quickly. However, there is a catch. If you consider the time constant, so the decay rate of these curves, then you find that the decay rate itself, that's shown here in the inset as a function of the system size, actually grows exponentially in the system size. So this basically tells us that um, you know, there is essentially no free lunch, uh, and that the, uh, the random agent trying to use two qubit unitaries um, uh, in order to disentangle the state, even though it manages to do that, uh, um, it, it will take it uh, infinitely uh, or exponentially long. And to see where the exponential comes from, um, you know, it's very simple. So if you have like a large state, um, you're applying two qubit gates, then all you care about again are two qubit reduced density matrices. But those guys for high random state are very close to an infinite temperature state, which is essentially the identity. And so all the information is essentially in this, in this little prefactor here, epsilon, which you know for high random state uh, scales exponentially. Uh, uh, with the system size. So that's where this exponential scaling comes from. So this is why random agents actually will struggle to solve this problem. Now you say, okay, let me try something else. So let me take what I call a greedy agent. A greedy agent is an agent that tries all possible pairs of qubits, you know, for a finite number of qubits, there are not so many. So let's try out all possible pairs. And then we're going to post-select that pair that minimizes the uh, entanglement locally. Um, and you can see here in the lower right what happens with the entanglement. So, you know, even though you gain a factor of two compared to the random agent, the scaling actually, the scaling loss persists. So in both cases, we find this exponential. So this is why the problem is, is difficult. And so the question actually that I want to 
raised in this, in this talk is, can we do better by using, so can we, yeah, can we figure out how to you know, disentangle states efficiently by using uh, partial information about the state? So what I'm going to allow myself is that I can measure locally uh, properties of my state, and then I want to use this information in order to interactively feed back um, um, and, co and correct for my control onto the system. Um, and so, you know, why do I think that that's a good idea? So, you know, first of all, if I have more information, then I'd better be able to do uh, better than the, uh, than the, you know, random agent. But then I can also potentially do better than the greedy agent. And the reason is, you know, the following. So I just want to uh, uh, recall, you know, last time um, you tried to disentangle, you know, like a knot, uh, you very quickly realize that it's basically a huge mess. And then the order of operations in which you try to do the disentangling actually matters, right? And so for the same reason, if you actually go for the greedy operation, this is the greedy agent, you're not necessarily going to be optimal in disentangling quantum states. And this is why we think that, you know, we can also do better uh, than the, uh, than the greedy agent. Um, so, uh, however, as I mentioned, we want to impose physical constraints uh, on the e obtainable information here. Um, so clearly, you know, what I want is I want access to the full quantum state, um, but that's not possible. So quantum, sta uh, quantum states, uh, uh, you know, they're nice mathematical constructs, but no one can measure them directly. So in other words, uh, full state tomography is exponentially costly in the number of qubits, so this is a no-go. However, Two qubit reduced density matrices can be contained, and they can be contained at the computed, and they can be computed with a, a cost that goes only as the square of the number of qubits. So I'm going to allow myself to do that. And then, you know, what I need for my algorithm is I need access to the figure of merit, so I need to be able to compute single qubit reduced density matrices, and from them to estimate the average entanglement, single qubit entanglement. And second, I also need to construct this locally optimal two qubit gates, and this is something that I went through very quickly, so I want to stress once again, these actually do depend on the state itself, so I will need, uh, you know, the, the two qubit reduced density matrices. So once again, I'm going to allow myself to measure all two qubit reduced density matrices. They're L squared of them, uh, or L times L minus 1 over 2. Um, and uh, then from them, I can determine the single qubit reduced density matrices and then the figure of merit, but I can also compute my, my local gates. Okay, so that's the, uh, the um, um, multi-qubit disentangling problem that, that, that I'm setting up. And the question is now, how do we use reinforcement learning um, in, order, uh, in order to find a, a unitary or a sequence, if you wish, a circuit of unitaries uh, that disentangles arbitrary states? So I just want to very briefly uh, mention what reinforcement learning is for those who weren't here last week. So in a nutshell, reinforcement learning is the way you teach your dog to sit. So you say sit 10 times, and the dog sits once, but when it does so, you give it a treat. So you reinforce a certain type of behavior. And because of that, reinforcement learning naturally entails interactive dynamics, right? So there's an interaction between an agent, here the dog, and the environment, um, the person who's teaching the dog. And the way that works is the agent is trying to solve a task, in this way, to sit down, by choosing actions, to sit or not to sit. But whenever an action is chosen, then there's a reward that's fed back to the agent, okay? So there's this reinforcing, reinforcement loop that goes in. So reinforcement learning is kind of famous for, uh, or became famous for playing games recently. And one of the games that you could imagine it playing is actually the Tetris game. So in this case, the agent would be allowed to take actions like left, right, turn left, turn right, hold or drop, you know, like this corresponding, um, um, this corresponding uh, brick here. Uh, and then based on that, um, you know, there would be a reward. In this case, the score that will be fed back to the agent. And importantly, the agent is allowed to observe the state of the game. Uh, and based on that, it's supposed to be taking the actions. And the reason I'm making this analogy here um, with the Tetris game is because recently there was an interesting paper that showed that disentangling states uh, is actually very similar to playing a Tetris game. So in some sense, finding where to place an optimal unitary is similar to finding where to drop a brick here uh, in, this, in this Tetris. And so from that perspective, the question that I'm asking here can be phrased the, as the following way. So can we play disentangling games in a smart way? So let me show you now how that works. So again, we have an agent. The agent has to learn how to disentangle states by interacting with its environment. What does this environment contain? The environment contains the qubit, so the, the, the quantum state, S. However, the agent does not have access to the state. The agent only has access to observations of the state, which you know, consist of all two qubit reduced density matrices. So we are going to then uh, consider actions. So the 
agent is going to select the pairs of qubits to place an optimal two qubit unitary on, right? So that's what the agent looks at. So if you think about it, in other words, you can think of the agent as a probability distribution over all qubit pairs, right? And then there would be, you know, one pair that would have the maximum probability, and that's the action that the agent will take. Um, and so the, uh, uh, the agent uh, takes this action, and then it places the gate, uh, you know, it places the gate to the state. This is going to lead to a new state, um, and then from the new state, we can again compute the observations, and that's what the agent then looks at before taking uh, the next action. And then finally, there's also the reward that we give to the agent. So what we want to do is we want to minimize the uh, single qubit, the average single qubit entanglement. Uh, now, this is a complicated expression. Literally, what it tells you is that we are looking at the relative entanglement entropy of the state, so in the relative change of the entanglement entropy. And then we also want to have a penalty for, you know, the number of qubits left to be disentangled because we want to incentivize the agent to use as few gates as possible. And uh, for the experts in the audience, then the actual algorithm that's behind it uh, is the actor critical algorithm. And there's something that uh, goes behind the scenes there, which I'd be happy to discuss in detail, but I'd rather leave it like that um, as, a, as, a, as a black box. So this was a little bit quick, so let me recap it one more time. So what we have is we have an interactive feedback loop. Uh, the states are um, um, the, the full states of the system, but the agent only has access to uh, observations, and the observations are the two qubit reduced density matrices. And then what this agent is producing in the end is it's producing an action which is telling me which pair of qubits do I have to place my uh, optimal two qubit reduced density matrix in. And then the agent itself will consist of an actor and a critic. And this is a machine learning model that would, in the end, um, um, produce a prob the probability distribution from which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, drawing uh, actions. And if we now look into that blue box here, um, what we find is that, OK, so there's the actor and there's the critic. And so these are some, you can think of them as some neural networks, essentially. Uh, um, so they, you know, in the end, mimic a probability distribution. So somewhere at the top, there has to be a softmax layer to make it a probability. Um, then uh, we do have like this blue linear layer. So these are simply fully connected layers uh, with some weights and biases. So machine learning parameters theta. And then the interesting bit here are the orange layers. So there's these encoders. So we're basically using transformers. And the reason why we're using transformers can be ex uh, explained here with uh, uh, this picture um, on the left. So suppose that you have a state of four qubits. Now, if you know, you know how to act, how to disentangle that state, for instance, by using this circuit here on the left, if I now take two of these qubits and I swap them, so I permute some of the qubits, then this automatically will tell me how to permute my circuit in such a way that it still disentangles it, right? So I want a machine learning architecture that is invariant or equivariant to swaps to permutation. So if I swap something in my input data in my state, then it automatically corrects for the output, corrects for the actions. And it turns out that transformers, the way you know them, um, actually are permutation equivariant. The tiny little difference to chat GPT and to language models is that there, this permutation equivariance is explicitly broken by a so-called embedding. And here, we don't use such an embedding because we want to make use um, um, of, this, of this feature. And finally, you know, just one single word about the reinforcement learning algorithm. I'm sure that last week Florian explained to you how policy gradient works. So the actor critic, uh, critic algorithm is essentially a variant of policy gradient. So my agent is um, uh, trying to maximize the cumulative expected return. And it's doing so uh, essentially by doing gradient descent in this parameter space. So that's all um, you need to do. OK, good. So with this, I basically introduced the problem and the method. So now I want to show you what we can do with these agents. So let's start very simple, and let's just consider a state of only two qubits. So I'm talking about arbitrary states here. Now, OK, by definition, I'm, I'm using uh, you know, local, lo uh, local two qubit disentangling gates. So it means that a single um, unitary, basically, is enough to disentangle any two qubit state. If I have three qubits, three qubit states, then it turns out that to disentangle it fully, so to bring it into a product state, what I need to do is I need to place my local uh, um, unitary on qubits one and two, and then another one on qubits two and three. And these two, two qubit gates are enough to bring any entangled or not entangled, any three qubit state basically into a product state. So these are two simple cases in some sense. But the interesting thing happens when you uh, actually consider four qubits. And now we want to test a trained agent. So I took the agent, I trained it, and I want to see how it's going to perform. And to test how it's going to perform, I want to give it states that I know basically the entanglement structure of. 
So what you see here on the left is an initial state, which is a product of two Bell states, two Bell pairs on qubits one and two, and then the second pair on qubits three and four. And what you see here on the, um, on the right is the um, policy of the agent, so the probability of taking the different pairs uh, um, you know, at, at the given time. So basically, when it looks at the initial state, then it correctly recognizes uh, that with a 50% probability, it should place the unitary uh, on qubits 1 and 2 or qubits 3 and 4. And indeed, it doesn't matter which one uh, of the two it should act on. And then in that case, you know, by chance, the agent decides to pick up 1 and 2, so that's the red color upon which this probability immediately collapses uh, in such a way that then at the second stage when the agent looks at the observations, at the two qubit reduced density matrices, it immediately recognizes that it has to act on qubits three and four, and then the state is fully disentangled. So this is simple. So let's make it a little bit more interesting. So let's take now a GHZ state on qubits two, three, and four, and this I'm taking with the product state um, basically with, of, of qubit one. So the Agent looks again at the observations, and then in this case, it realizes that all the pairs 2, 3, 2, 4, and 3, 4 um, show up with the same probability of this case, one third. So in other words, it correctly recognizes the structure of entanglement uh, in this uh, GHZ state, and then, you know, like we had, um, 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 it's basically applying the optimal two qubit um, um, strategy where it only takes um, um, two unitaries in order to disentangle the state. And notice, after it applies the first unitary, then it already, and it looks at the state, uh, it already knows that, you know, there's only one possible action that's, that's left um, to go. Okay, so, so far you're saying not quite impressive because we already knew what the entanglement structures of these states are. So let's now really go to the application of where these agents can be useful. So let's take a three qubit high random state, um, tensor product with a you know, single qubit high random state. So this R here stands for a random, and then the number of qubits that show here in the sub-index, these, uh, these give you the support um, of the state. So in this case, you don't really know where the entanglement in the state is, right? I just drew this state from some uh, uh, hard distribution, and then the agent looks at the observations, and then it uh, figures out that it's advantageous to apply the gate on qubits one and three. It applies that gate, and then afterwards it figures out that it has to apply the gate on qubits one and two, and after two steps, uh, in the end, uh, it finds the, uh, uh, the product state. And again, because this is effectively a three qubit state here, it only requires two, uni uh, two, two, uh, um, two unitaries um, to do that, two gates to do that. And now you can imagine, you know, here on the left is the most uh, interesting or the most uh, uh, difficult situation for four qubits where there's absolutely no uh, entanglement structure in the state whatsoever. So this is a fully uh, uh, random, high random state on four qubits. And in this case, you don't really know what these actions mean. But what's actually important is that the agent takes exactly five two qubit unitaries. And you can actually analyze this sequence. So now that you know, we've seen this happening, what you can do is you can analyze um, this uh, five qubit sequence and you can draw a couple of conclusions. And the interesting thing is that it takes exactly five unitaries to disentangle any four qubit states, right? So you give me your favorite four qubit state and then my agent is gonna use no more than five two qubit unitaries. And this is already a little bit, um, um, a little bit surprising, but okay, there's essentially no free lunch here. The, the catch, if you wish, is that these unitaries depend on the state itself. So if you change the state, then I also change the unitaries. What's, uh, what's non-trivial is that the circuit topology is universal. So I don't have to change where to place those qubits, right? I can always use essentially this same circuit. And again, there's a proof for this which goes like in four lines, um, but in the interest of time, I'd rather move forward to show you some, uh, uh, some bigger states. Just a tiny remark, so any four qubit state, so you can show by just counting the number of C naught gates that, that is required you know, uh, to implement this circuit, and you can show that uh, actually you need no more than 10 C naught gates. So this is actually you know, a little bit uh, surprising because uh, you know that an arbitrary two qubit gate requires three C naughts in general, so you would, might have expected you know, 15 C naughts, but no, it's actually 10, and you can actually do the counting to see, uh, to see how, how this comes about. Okay, so this was essentially, you know, the, the, the small system, you know, the, the, the four qubit system where you can benchmark the agent and, and, and see how that goes. So now I want to show you what happens when you go, you know, above to like five and six qubits. We will stop at six qubits because as I showed you in the beginning, there's an exponential wall and, you know, this exponential wall comes from the restriction of using only two qubit gates, but that's physical, so we're gonna play the games according to physics. Um, but before that, yeah, let's go to the five qubit state. 
Okay, so now I want to explain to you here a picture that's going to very easily uh, start getting crowded. And so let's do this now step by step. So first, what we consider is a five qubit higher random state, which I'm going to denote here by these five circles, Q1 to, uh, through, through Q5. And, you know, these qubits can be entangled in an, in, you know, in, in an arbitrary way. On the x-axis here, you see the episode step. So this is, you know, as I said, you know, the reinforcement learning works like in terms of this feedback loop. So every time there's going to be a unitary to be placed. So this is the episode step is essentially telling you, uh, um, you know, uh, there's one basically step uh, per unitary. And at every step, the agent will be looking at the reduced density matrices, and then it's going to be estimating what is the probability to place uh, a two-qubit unitary at a specific pair of qubits. And like in this case, for instance, the largest probability is between qubits three and five, and therefore I'm placing um, a gate between uh, qubits three and five, and then this little number here, 57, um, um, shows you the probability with which this action has been chosen. There's no space in the figure to show all the other probabilities, but the ones that chosen is there. And now there are those circles as well. In, um, so the circles show you the, uh, entangle, so the entanglement entropy between that qubit and the rest of the system, okay? So for the first qubit, you know, it's 0.99, so it's, you know, they're all actually fairly entangled with, 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 uh, with the rest. Uh, and then this number here is the average, uh, basically this expression here, so the um, uh, quantity that, that, that we want to measure. Now what you'll see in a second is that these circles are gonna start changing colors when that happens, what it means is that the entanglement entropy drops down by one order of magnitude as you go from red to blue to green, and then, you know, uh, and then there's like the, uh, the gray one. So a rest here is not, is not the verb rest, it means all the other pairs, okay? So uh, I don't have enough space on this graph to show, you know, L squared pairs, right? So I can show you the most interesting ones and then probabilities that are smaller than 1%. I don't care about them anyway. Yeah, but there's no action where the agent doesn't do anything. Yeah, sorry about that confusion. Okay, good. So let's see now. So let's take a, a five qubit high random state and let's see how this, you know, circuit looks like that the agent produced. So if you take a look at it, you know, it looks like a complete mess, right? And in fact, it is more or less a, a mess, but there is some interesting structure that I want to explain in a second. Now, let's first make the first observation. So you can kind of see, even after applying, you know, 19 gates, there's still some entanglement entropy left in the state. This entanglement entropy is below 10 to the minus three, and that's actually the threshold that we set to the agent. So we say, okay, if you bring my state into an almost product state up to 10 to the minus three, then I can see that this problem solved, and then, um, you know, we can, we can move forward. So that's the first thing. So we have to place a threshold. This wasn't the case when we considered four, three, or two qubit states, but from five qubits on, um, um, it actually is um, a feature of the problem. Now, the second thing that you see here <clears throat> Um, is that the circuit has, is actually highly correlated, and it's correlated both in space and in time. And I want to explain this by uh, basically pointing you know, towards the right places of, of this feature. So what I mean by the, by the circuit being correlated in time is that, you see, the agent starts applying you know, gates, but initially all the gates involve qubit number three. So for some reason, qubit number three is special, and then it continues to be special until you know, the Single qubit entanglement entropy of qubit three is depleted. It goes down to 0.18. And at that stage, the agent says, okay, you know, screw, you know, qubit three. I have to move over and jump up to other qubits where I can now draw more entanglement from my system. And then it jumps again, but then you see like, again, the gates that follow, once again, the, the, you know, always the next gate, you know, shares support with the previous gate. Um, okay, so this is also clear here to, in the end. You know, there's like a very long sequence where there's always this shared support. So in that sense, there's correlations between space and time. But it's actually a little bit more interesting than that. It turns out that even though this circuit is, is essentially random, and it is random, there's, you should not look for structure you know, in a circuit where you start from a high random state because you, know, you gave me another high random state and the whole circuit is going to change again. But these features actually are gonna be robust. And so the second feature is a topological property of this circuit. So it turns out you can decompose the circuit into topological segments that I've highlighted here in colors, and they go like that. So let me take the five qubits and let me place these five qubits on vertices of a graph, right? 
And then what I will do is I will start, you know, drawing connections between these vertices, but in the order prescribed by the circuit. So let's take now this um, orange, sorry, this uh, purple um, um, oval here. So I interest it in qubit three. Then first, you know, I apply, you know, a gate between three and five. So I go to, uh, you know, from three to five and back. Then I go from three to four. Then I go from three to one. Then I go from three to two. And then if I have to go, you know, to the blue part of the circuit, I will have to, you know, lift the pencil and then draw another connection between four and five. Then I have to lift the pencil again, and then I go to the green um, uh, circuit, right, which uh, essentially connects qubits uh, two and one, and then two and five, um, and then five and one, right? So there's like this topological uh, property, um, um, you know, something that allows you to uh, classify, you know, the, the, the mess essentially. In other words, you know, it's, it's often the case when uh, any kind of correlations fail, then, you know, you look for the most robust one, and then if, if there is something, it's got to be topological. But the, uh, oh yeah, and then there's one more uh, take-home message here, which I want to make, which is also interesting. So you might have thought, well, you know, if I had to solve this problem, what I would try to do is I would try to kind of factor out one of the five qubits, right? So maybe what I can do is I can factor out one of the five qubits and then I'm left with a four qubit state and then I already have my optimal strategy for the four qubit state that I showed you before, then I can just apply that. But if you actually look at the final, um, um, you know, uh, stage of the sequence, so where you basically disentangle one of the qubits from the rest, where you see the gray color for the first time, then you see that the sequence here looks quite a bit more different uh, than the optimal one. And this essentially tells you that the agent doesn't necessarily follow this divide and conquer strategy. We have seen examples for other states where the agent does use the divide and conquer strategy, but it doesn't always have to use it. And whenever it's not using it, like in this case, it's actually interesting because it tells us that the agent learns how to, how to implement non-local multi-body interactions among all the qubits. So it doesn't really focus on a subset. No, it tries to involve all the qubits in the disentangling process. Okay, good. So let's move a little bit forward. So these were five qubits. Now you may wonder, okay, um, you know, uh, was this just the luck that, uh, uh, you know, that it was able to disentangle that specific car random state? So what about statistics? And this is what I'm showing you here. So what we are doing now is we are considering a number, basically ensembles of different high random states. And these high random states are classified according to this product structure. Um, um, I think this is more or less self-explanatory. Now, on the y-axis, what I'm plotting is the number of unitaries, so the length of the protocol. And uh, there are numbers here on this histogram. So first of all, there are colors, right? So there are three colors. Uh, the black color is the RL agent. That's the most interesting one. But remember the other two agents, right? So the random agent and the greedy agents. Now they show up again here. These are the two blue colors. Um, and in all the cases, you see that the RL agent actually outperforms all the other, uh, uh, all the other agents. And this is what I meant you know, earlier. You, know, you can do better than a greedy agent. And this is because what reinforcement learning is doing is it doesn't, you know, um, locally optimize, you know, for the given state and the given action, but instead it optimizes the long time return, right? So it optimizes a non-local objective. And this is why it can actually learn to sacrifice certain actions intermittently, but then gain something um, towards the end. Um, all right. So now, and then, okay. And then these numbers are showing us the mean, right? So the mean number of, of unitaries required to disentangle these states. Um, and uh, there's also the standard deviation around that uh, with the size of the bar. So this is, you know, what the agent does on uh, high random five qubit uh, states. Now you can wonder what about like four qubit or six qubit states. So here's the data. So it basically behaves in, 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 in more or less the exact same way. Um, and um, um, as, you, as you kind of expect, so there's something interesting here. If you look at the five qubit um, um, uh, high random states, so states that are supported on all five qubits, then the agent takes basically 20 um, gates to get to disentangle the state. Now, if you look at the six qubit high random state, which has a product structure in such a way that there's uh, a product of five qubit high random states with a, with a six qubit, then, you know, this uh, also takes about 20 gates. So it's kind of consistent in between. And that's, you know, a way how to test um, the performance of the agent um, as, you, as you scale it up. Because again, you know, you, you don't really know uh, what, these, what these states are. All right. 
Good. So another thing that you should uh, also, um, you know, that I should also mention here that you should notice that, that the number m, the number of gates, actually grows, and it likely grows exponentially, you know, as you uh, as you increase the uh, number of qubits. And that's again a feature that's um, um, that's uh, imposed by only considering two qubit unitary. So if you try to disentangle a high random state with only two qubit gates, then uh, it turns out that you cannot beat the exponential, and that's actually something that's a mathematical fact and you can show. Okay, so it looks like I do have a couple of minutes, maybe not, uh, for, for applications. <clears throat> okay, good, so I do want questions, so let me maybe just uh, uh, show you very quickly. So what you can do now with, with, with these is you can use them in order to um, decompose circuits in terms of C0 gates, and what happens here is that the protocols found by the agent are the ones that require the least number of C0 gates, gates and we compare this you know, to Qiskit, so this is kind of state-of-the-art tool, uh, and uh, our agent is actually being able to outperform Qiskit in a number of, of, of those. So it, you can find basically compressed circuits by doing this. We also tested the agent in the presence of noise, and there are various kinds of noise that you can think of. For instance, noise in estimating the reduced density matrices, or noisy uh, channels, like you know, decoherence channels, depolarizing channels, etc., in which the agent uh, basically is robust to a certain extent. And this is maybe the last thing that I want to show. So we also try to apply this agent on actual NIST devices where all kind of noises are, uh, are present. Um, so this, you know, we did this starting from the bell-bell stair, and then in this case, you know, the agent correctly identified, you know, the right probabilities after the first, um, 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 sorry, before applying the first gate. After applying the first gate, the probabilities are still roughly the same, and the reason for this is that the state here is very much entangled with the environment. So it's not actually a pure state um, as, as it used to be anymore. Now you can quantify this by looking at entanglement, deformation, et cetera, and you can try other bell-bell states or GHD states, um, and um, you know, I'd be happy to show you these data if you're interested, like in a private, uh, um, you know, in a private conversation. So now I think I'd rather leave some time for questions. Just one thing I want to mention, you know, if there's anyone who's interested in trying out our agent in the lab, please let us know, we'd be happy to collaborate. So thank you guys for the attention. Hi, Mani. I'm, I missed the initial part of your talk, sorry for that, and I'm sure you probably give the motivation there, but I was wondering what exactly can I learn about the disentangling process when you found these very nice topological structures in time, if I understood correctly? Well, so th these are structures in, uh, in, in, in the circuit. Now, I mean, I wouldn't know immediately what the good use for this is. It just tells us that, um, um, that if you really are looking for an optimal, so for a compressed circuit, uh, then the compressed circuit is necessarily highly correlated. So in other words, you, you, know, you don't have the freedom of placing the gates wherever you want. You have to place them in a very specific way, and the way in which you have to place them depends on the state itself. Uh, and this is actually the big advantage of using reinforcement learning, that by looking at these local observations of reduced two-qubit density matrices, you can actually say, aha, it is these two qubits that I need to place the gaze on and not, you know, something else. So, yeah. Hello. Can you put your first transference? I think I found something that I didn't understand there. Sorry, the at first? the beginning, yes, 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 when you were saying, yeah, I mean, I think what you are saying is that your method, it's very useful because if you want to prepare, so these are unitary, so you can revert. So if you want to prepare something which is very complex, you have the best circuit, it can do it. So if you reverse everything in the other direction because That's everything right. are unitary, yeah. so it's indeed very useful. But I want to go a little bit before. Uh, you have to stop. Yeah, when you were saying, yeah, 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 at the very beginning, because you were saying, uh, here, no, no, here. Uh, when you say, this I was a little bit confused, but probably I understood that, no? So if I have a pure state, which is multipartite entanglement, and I trace out one of the systems, okay, that, and I found that it's a product state, that doesn't mean anything, no? On the... No, so what you do is you have, you have an L-qubit state, and then you look at the single qubit reduced density matrix. Yes. And that's potentially entangled with all the other qubits, right? Now let's say that I find that it's not, right? then it basically means that you know, qubit A is in a product state with the rest. 
Are you sure? <laughs> so I, I'm sorry, eh? I'm a yeah, little bit confused. I, I, I have I, a double, I, I have a G8 set, yeah. okay, which is three partite entanglement. Yeah. I trace out any of the systems and it's, it's not entangled, okay? I trace a second system, it's not entangled, but obviously the G8 set, the pure state, it's entangled. So now I'm a little bit confused. Sorry, I'm saying probably something which I don't understand properly, but if I start by a multipartite system so and I trace... Th you know, there is entanglement in the state, but it's among the remaining two. No, there is not entanglement whatsoever, okay? So I have a GH set state. I, I, trace I did have the GHZ state as an example. Exactly, but you have zero, zero, zero yeah. plus one, 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 okay? I do the reduced density matrix. Here, that's... B and C, they yeah. are disentangled. Okay. So, okay, so let's, let's do that. So th there's a three qubit state, right? Then you basically apply, um, you know, a gate on qubits two and three, right? And then what this is doing is it's essentially, you know, it's, it's cutting that bond and then it's shifting the entanglement on, on the remaining two qubits. Like, With the unitary I, that you are doing, yes, but I just was I a little bit surprised. I even have like the, proof of, the proof of this thing that I'd be happy to go over. Um, no, no, with a unitary, I'm, sure, I'm just saying that tracing out Okay, you have a system. Maybe with the confusion comes from, from the fact that um, I actually consider the state of the system to be pure at all times. When I apply the gate, I apply it on the pure state, and then I'm getting a new state that is also pure. So at any given point of time, I keep a pure state. That's the statement. If it's non-zero, then you apply a gate. <laughs> Got discussion. Can we way. continue uh, uh, over a coffee break, maybe? We can, I'd be happy to go over this in detail. I'm pretty sure that this is out. <laughs> no, no, that, that's fine. It's good to go over. So I think we have to move to the uh, next speaker. Uh, let's thank uh, Marine okay. again for a nice talk.